Let's pray together. Thank you for the foundation of Jesus Christ. The church is built upon him. And Lord, I pray that you would help us now as we come to your word again. Please reveal Jesus Christ to us. Help us to see him. Help us to love him. Help us to worship him. Help us to adore him. Help us to serve him and obey him because he truly is worthy. And I pray that our lives would be dedicated to him. Focus our thoughts, our attention, focus every part of ourselves, Jesus, upon you right now. I pray in your name. Amen. I find some of the TV commercials, especially the ones for various uh, medications and pharmaceuticals, honestly to be a little bit, if I can use the word, disturbing. I understand that they have great value and great worth and they're important. But I tell you, after some of these commercials, after a testimonial, to, a testimonial or two of success and then some kind of emotionally moving examples of some, how someone's life has been greatly enriched by certain medications, then the announcer will share in, in, in what kind of is a little bit faster speech, kind of like trying to get through it, but sometimes just a whole litany of possible side effects. Have you noticed that? Now, they'll still keep showing you the nice sentimental story there, but he's talking about, the announcer will be talking about some of these things, and I have to tell you, some of them are downright frightening. And so maybe they have, I suppose they have to do that for legal reasons, to share some of the, the possible side effects. I really don't know that for sure, but, but I tell you, again, if you really pay attention, I think to myself, my goodness, I don't know that I would want, if I needed that medication, I don't know if I would dare take it because of some of the possible side effects. But, but evidently, at least from their marketing strategy, they can convey the idea that the, that the benefits far outweigh the possible uh, side effects and therefore are worthwhile. The reason I mention that is because that is completely the opposite of the way the Apostle Paul approaches things here. As we continue in our journey of 2 Timothy, no one could ever accuse Paul of sugarcoating his message to Timothy. For the past few weeks, we have been looking at really his emphasis on suffering, and it doesn't really stop in what we have seen. It will continue on here. Remember, 2 Timothy is the last letter that we have in the Bible that Paul wrote. He wrote it while he was in prison. He wrote it shortly before his execution. He knew he was going to die, and so therefore I think that there's a sense of urgency uh, in the things that he says. I think that there's certainly priority to his message. And so what Paul does then is he challenges his young friend Timothy, who is a pastor at a church in Ephesus, he challenges him to be bold for Jesus encouraging him to stay faithful, to stay true. But yet all the while, he mentions to Timothy, he does not cover up, he doesn't delete, he doesn't try to hide it, he doesn't camouflage it at all. He emphasizes to him that, there, that faithful service to Jesus Christ will result in suffering and pain. For example, uh, verses we've already looked at, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says, share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he writes, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Chapter 2, verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, rather than trying to downplay or speed through the expected sufferings, what Paul does is he builds his theology here for Timothy and for us upon the reality that we will suffer. But it doesn't end there. There is some really good news. There, and that news, of course, is based in Jesus Christ. And so what we are going to look at here today is four reasons that Paul gives Timothy and us to continue to persevere in serving Jesus. Four reasons to stay the course even through the hard times. The first reason is the greatness of our Savior. I want you to follow along. Hopefully you're already in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2. I want to read verse 8 and just have you follow along as I do that. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. See, Paul's telling him here to remember Jesus. That didn't mean that he thought, well, 
But Timothy, I don't know. I don't know if his memory's all that good. I, th I just want to make sure he doesn't actually forget about Jesus, and so therefore I'm just kind of telling him, you know, hey, remember, uh, my wife does all the time, remember? And I'm like, no, I really don't. Did you even tell me that? And at least in her, according to her story, she has. It's to be debated. Um, I would like to defend myself and say that sometimes I think she didn't say those things. But regardless, even if she did, I would forget. True, I would. So, but he's not telling him to remember that way. It's more the idea of this. Think about Jesus. Reflect on who he is. Let your mind dwell on him. Let Jesus be the focal point of your thoughts. That's what he's saying here when he says, remember Jesus. It's like, don't forget. It's like, no, focus upon Jesus Christ. And look what he says. Remember, in other words, focus on Jesus, risen from the dead. Just think about what that means. Since Jesus rose from the dead, we have nothing to fear. In this, in this letter that deals a lot with suffering, we still have nothing to fear, even in the midst of sufferings and hard times. Because understand this, and you know this, this is what our faith is based upon, death did not defeat Jesus Christ. Jesus defeated death. That's how great he is. In fact, let me put it this way. I think it's important to understand this. Jesus is not great because he rose from the grave. It's not like, wow, he rose from the grave. That made him pretty great. No. Jesus rose from the grave because he is great. Death could not defeat him. It could not. Satan cannot defeat him. Sin cannot defeat him. That's how great our Jesus is. And so I think what Paul is saying here is, think about that, Timothy. Think about how great your Savior is in the midst of the sufferings and the hard times you're going through. Think about, remember him, dwell upon him, and so therefore stay the course. And I think if Paul was alive today, he would say to us, remember that Red Pine Bible Church, remember that about your Savior, Stay the course, because he is great. He is great, he is powerful, he is victorious, he is a death-defeating savior. And he is alive and he shall be forevermore. That's how great our savior is. So in the midst of the hard times, Timothy, in the midst of the difficulties, Red Pine, think about Jesus Christ and how great he is. Remember that. Gives us a second reason to stay the course. And that is the greatness of God's word. Let's look at verse 9. He says, As priest in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. If that's not underlined in your Bible, it should be. In fact, you may want to just look at the person next to you. If it's not underlined in their Bible, I give you permission to reach over. No, don't do that. Okay, uh, don't do that. But what a powerful verse that is. As Paul then, as he's sitting in his prison cell, as he's reflecting upon his imprisonment there, he makes this incredible comparison. I, I, I just kind of picture him. He's kind of looking at the chains that are around his, his hands and wrists, and he looks maybe down at the chains that are around his feet. And he didn't become indignant because of them. It wasn't like he's like, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. How dare they bind me locked in this stinking Roman prison with these chains like I'm nothing more than a common criminal. Paul, he didn't become indignant about that. And neither did, neither did he feel sorry for himself. He didn't just sit there and think about how unfair life was. You know, I, it would have been easy, I think. It's like, well, that's Paul. <laughs> I've traveled, I've traveled almost the entire known world telling people about Jesus Christ. And here I am, locked up in this Roman prison, knowing that I'm going to be killed on any day. I deserve so much better. And he did deserve better. But again, that's not where Paul went. That's not his focus. No, instead what he did is he contrasted his position. He looked at the chains that bound him. And he contrasted that with the word of God. And I love how he did that. 
I am bound with chains, but the word of God is not bound. There is so much power in the word of God. My friends, it is just such a truth that we need to embrace and we need to cherish this. Let that cha change the way that you live, especially when you face the difficulties, especially when you face the hard times, especially when you're going through suffering. Look at the word of God. Let that guide you and carry you through the tough times. It's so easy. I, I know that it's easy for all of us to do this, where we look at the world around us and we kind of feel like, man, oh man, everything is out of control. Right? It's so easy to be discouraged by life. You think about how you're feeling or the, the, maybe the financial difficulties or your people that you love are going through hard times or maybe there's severe sickness or illness or maybe recent death. We look at those things and it's so easy for us to become discouraged by life. It's so easy for us to become even depressed at what we are going through or what other people are enduring. But think about this with me. What if, instead of letting ourselves dwell on the sorrow, what if we embraced, what if we embraced God's word? What if we believed in the power of this written word to change lives? I tell you, it is not bound. It is not restricted. It is not limited. It is powerful. It is life changing. A few verses just to, that I wanted to share with you. Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Oh, the word of God is not bound. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. This, I, I pray this every Sunday. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. <laughs> I claim that every Sunday because not, not my words, my goodness, certainly not, but the powers in the word of God. It will accomplish exactly what God intends for it to do. It will change lives. Now, maybe you say, well, that's just, you know, it's great to read a few verses like that, Rick, okay. But let's deal with the real world that we live in, okay? I say, okay. <laughs> if you say so, let's do it. Let me, let me just share an example from the real world. I believe that you would be hard-pressed to find a more secular society than China, right? It is steeped. It has been steeped in communism, communism for decades. And in many places, it is still even illegal to possess a Bible, and it's illegal to meet together to worship Jesus. And so what has happened through the, the past few decades is that the church of God, it has been driven underground. In other words, they often meet in secret. They, they are doing that because otherwise their worship services might be broken up they might be arrested you never know what's going to happen in regards to that so the church meets in secret they can't often go into a public forum like what we are doing here and yet this amazes me even the most conservative estimates in other words if anything this is on the low side but even the most conservative estimates put the number of christians in china between 60 to 80 million people how is that possible i'll tell you it is because the word of god is not and cannot and will not be bound in fact oh this is staggering some experts predict that by 2030 10 years from now 2030 that there will be more christians in china than there are in the united states the church is growing that rapidly, even though they have to meet in secrecy. Why? Because the word of God is not bound. And some even predict that by 2050, that's just 30 years away, China could be a majority Christian country. That's the power of the word of God to change lives. I tell you, it is not bound. Now, just in case there are any skeptics, and I know there are none here, but uh, let, for, the sake, 
for the sake of argument, let's just pretend that maybe some of you are a little bit skeptical and you might think, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, that's great news about China, but that's just one country. Do you have anything else? Thank you for asking. <laughs> because I do. And I think that this is so exciting too. Let's talk about the country of Iran. I mean, for the past, what, two, three weeks, it has been in the news uh, quite often as tensions between our two countries are extremely high. And certainly that country, it's not steeped in secularism like China. It is steeped instead in the false religion, religion of Islam. Certainly we think that country, that country is close to the power of the word of God, right? Wrong. Let me quote from Rebecca McLaughlin's amazing book, Confronting Christianity. I recommended this to you last week. I am going to continue to recommend this book. But she writes this. Today there are hundreds of thousands of Christians in Iran. Sprouting from a tiny seed, the Iranian church is the fastest growing Christian movement in the world. We watch the news and we see this, just millions of people and they all seem to be just, they're Muslims and so they are misguided and they are, they are forsaking Jesus Christ and we just think, wow, the gospel cannot be making inroads into that country. And we are so wrong when we think that. Isn't that incredible? That's, I think, part of what Jesus meant in Matthew 24, verse 35. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. I tell you, the word of God is not bound. That's just so encouraging. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives us a third reason to, to stay the course, and that's the greatness of our salvation. Let's look at again here in 2 Timothy 2, now verse 10. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, some people get really freaked out with this word where Paul is talking about here, where he says, for the sake of the elect. And they're like, oh, I, I, that, that doctrine of election thing, I'm pretty uncomfortable with all of that. Now, let me just say this. We do not need to fully be able to explain or to fully understand how election and free will works together. I don't understand gravity. I don't. But I believe in it, right? I don't think you can deny election from Scripture. In fact, let me just take you. We're going to be back here to 2 Timothy in just a moment. We'll go to Ephesians. I think this is probably one of the clearest sections. It's, it's throughout Scripture. But this is just something I think we need to just look at. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to take you here because I do not want us to be afraid of this doctrine. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 3 through 8 and just ask that you would follow along as I do that. So Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, so, that, so or to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We don't need to be afraid of the doctrine of election. I don't understand how it all works, but I think it is one of the most remarkable things in the world that all of us who deserve death and hell, which by the way is every person who has ever lived, that is what we deserve, but the fact that God in his divine sovereignty, not because we deserve it, not because we're better than anyone else. No, but God in his sovereignty and grace and mercy reached out and he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. That shouldn't scare us. That shouldn't threaten us. That should thrill us. The fact that God has chosen any of us to be saved. And the thing about... Part of the problem with this doctrine is uh, because a lot of people have misused it. 
And what they claim basically is, hey, since God has chosen people, well, he's going to save whoever he wants to save, and we therefore don't even have a responsibility to share the message. We don't need to be responsible to, to, to witness to people. And basically some people take, misuse that doctrine and they claim it as a reason to free us from any obligation of evangelism. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. In fact, let's go back to 2 Timothy again. 2 Timothy 2 there. Paul writes this verse that we just looked at. He says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. When Paul said everything there, he meant it, didn't he? We've looked before at passages, other passages in, in Scripture where he suffered the intense suffering, the incredible amount of difficulties he went through because of his faith. But where is Paul at when he's writing this letter? Where is he? Prison. That's right, he is in a Roman prison. And he knows that any day something is going to happen to him. He knows that at any day they are going to take him out of that cell and they are going to lead him to some place and they are going to behead him. When he says... I endure everything for the sake of the elect. He truly meant it. But rather than feeling sorry for himself, what Paul did is he focused on the greatness of our salvation. That which brings, he ends that verse with, with eternal glory. You see, again, he understood what was going on here. So I say to you, yes, our sufferings can be so hard they can seem even overwhelming. They can be so difficult. But understand this, please. I know that sometimes it just seems like they last forever, but they're temporary. Because of Jesus Christ, however, because of the greatness of our Savior, because of the greatness of his word, and because of the greatness of our salvation that he offers to us, we will spend eternity celebrating with him. That's the difference between looking at the immediate future and not having any or much hope and looking towards the eternal future and having great hope. That's what we can do because of the greatness of the salvation that, we, uh, that Jesus offers to all of us. How do you know that you're one of the elect? <laughs> it's because you received. That's it. There, is no, there are no marks of maturity or specialness. or It's not a thing of intelligence. It's nothing of that. None of us deserve it. But the fact that he gives it to any of us is an absolute miracle of grace. And so therefore, since we don't know who has been chosen, what God tell, makes very clear to us in Scripture, we have a mandate that we are to share the gospel message with the unsaved people of the world. And those who have been chosen by God, they will receive. That is a marvelous, marvelous truth. Don't be scared off by that doctrine. Celebrate it. But understand the greatness of our salvation. The fourth reason to continue and stay the course is the greatness of our reward. Now what Paul does is he... He, he likes this. He says this a few different times in some of his books. He says, beginning in verse 11, he says, the saying is trustworthy. He, he says that in, in, in 1 Timothy. He says it in some other for, uh, books as well. But he quotes something. Now, we aren't sure what he's quoting here. We don't know if this is a hymn that the early church used. We don't know what this comes from. But he quotes something. And what he gives us there is three promises and one warning. Okay, three promises and one warning. Um, in these verses about our eternal reward. Number one, the promise, the first promise, promise number one mean, is dying means living. Look at your Bible there with me, verse 11. The saying is trustworthy for, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. Now, I look at that and I say, well, wait, is, is he talking about dying spiritually? Is he talking about dying physically? I think it's both. I think it's both. Spiritual death is dying to sin. Romans 6, 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the spiritual death. That's the spiritual death to sin. 
but I think he also certainly is talking about physical death. Obviously so. That physical death, that means that we will indeed be with Jesus in heaven forever. I think that that's part of what Paul, what we just saw there at the end of verse 10 where Paul is referring to, he talks about this eternal glory. So is he talking about dying physically, dying spiritually? I think he's talking about both. Neither one of them will separate us from our great Savior. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. That's promise number one. He gives a second promise. Promise number two is enduring means reigning. Verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. In other words, what Paul is saying is stay the course. <laughs> Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Even in the midst of your suffering, even in the midst of your hardships. Don't give up. Enduring means reigning. In fact, that, no, he says there, not only does he say we will be with Jesus, that's kind of how I would expect it. If we endure, we will be with him. But he says, if we endure, we will reign with him. Now, I don't understand all of what that means, but I'm thinking that's a really good thing. Would you agree? That's probably good news. I think so. In fact, I wonder if maybe that's part of what Paul meant in Romans 8, verse 37, when he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I don't understand it all, but I think it's a great thing. He says, if we endure, if we stay the course, we will reign with him. Now, after the second promise, then Paul stops and says, hey, there's a warning here. Got to give you the warning. Warning is this, denial means rejection the end of verse 12 if we deny him he also will deny us well that's just strike fear and terror into everyone but this doesn't mean that if in a moment of cowardice cowardice or weakness that someone denies being a follower of Jesus Christ that they can never be saved and that all hope is gone that's not what it means obviously it doesn't the Apostle Peter is probably the greatest example of that. He denied Jesus, uh, how many times did he do that? Three times. Three times. Three times he denied Jesus. And yet he gave his life, follow, the rest of his life, following Jesus Christ and serving him. So we know that this doesn't mean if someone just simply says the words, I deny Jesus, that that guarantees that they're lost forever. No. What Paul is talking about is a permanent rejection of Christ. A permanent denial of him as Savior. I think that's what Jesus meant in Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. He, he wrote, or excuse me, he said, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That is frightening to, to realize that there are some people who deny Jesus Christ, deny him as Savior, and because of that, he will deny them, right? Matthew will deny ever even knowing them. That's horrifying. So there is a severe warning. But then he also gives a third promise. Promise number three, his faithfulness is greater than our faithlessness. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. How great is that? We can have security in our salvation because our salvation is totally dependent upon Jesus Christ. We fail. We stumble. We screw up. We have weak faith. And yet, this is the thing. It's not dependent upon us. Jesus is the one who saves us. Our salvation is based totally upon him. And he is always faithful he is always true to who he is and to what he says aren't, aren't you glad for that if it was based on our ability to not fail or maybe okay well no one's going to be perfect so let me maybe we can get a 98 percent and we come in at 96 percent okay i'm being generous most of us would probably be a lot lower than that i know i would be aren't you thankful that when we screw up we're still forgiven Aren't you so thankful for Jesus, the greatness of our Savior, that his faithfulness is so much greater than our faithlessness? No wonder Paul said earlier here in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, he says, For I know whom I have believed, 
And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Jesus saves us and assures us that based on his righteousness and his righteousness alone, that we will be forever with him. And no one, no one, and that, that includes ourselves, not even ourselves, can snatch us out of our Father's hand. Oh, that is such good news. That is fantastic. So I say, stay the course, my friends. Even when life is hard, focus on the truth that we have here, that Paul shared with us. We have a great Savior. We have a great Bible. It cannot be bound. We have a great salvation, and we have a great reward waiting for us someday when at last we will get to see Jesus face to face. In the midst of your hardships, in the midst of your difficulties and your sufferings, I say this, stay the course. Stay the course. Be encouraged because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of that. Thank you that our salvation is all about Jesus and it's not about us. And I thank you that he is faithful even when we are not. And I pray God each of us would be encouraged today by that truth. Thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.